Welcome to Work This Way, a labor and employment podcast. I'm Tina Emerson, here today with Maynard Nexon labor and employment attorney, Jenny Cluvarius. Good to see you today. Hi, Tina. Well, we have a friend here today. We are joined by Paul Porter. He is a plaintiff's attorney from Cromer, Babb and Porter. He is certified in South Carolina Supreme Court as a specialist in employment and labor law. And his primary practice includes employment law, business litigation, sexual harassment, defamation law, and appeals. That is a lot of stuff. But you guys have known each other and you have been across the table from each other quite a few times. Jenny, introduce us to your friend. So, sure. We do regularly see Paul across the table from us in labor and employment cases. He is a formidable opponent, um, and he is going to give those of us who typically sit on the management side of the labor and employment table a little behind-the-scenes peek into what trends he's seeing on the plaintiff's side and, um, you know, things that he and his colleagues are following. Well, thank you both for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, Paul, before we get started, tell us about your practice and what a typical day looks like for you. Sure. When you're on the plaintiff side, every day is different. You, you And you have a lot of difference within every day. I might have consultations where I meet with prospective clients throughout the day. I might take a deposition, might argue a motion. It varies. A, a lot of what I do is... Uh, onboarding new clients intake. Today in particular, though, I, it was a half day. I took my uh, toddler to the playground, but I'll be getting to work this afternoon. Well, it can't be, can't be all work, no play. So we're glad you had the opportunity to do that. Thank you. So Paul, start us off by telling us, and this is kind of a loaded question, but what trends are you seeing um, from your clients who walk in the door on the employment front? Certainly. So we still see, you know, the, the normal practice areas, discrimination work, sexual harassment. But right now, what I think you could say is a trend or an uptick is, is economic, uh, economic type uh, claims or economic distress. You're seeing layoffs. Um, you're seeing claims where employers are not paying employees their wages, either by way of misclassification or just not paying the wages due. Um, I think that's, you know, perhaps market driven. And, and we're seeing a lot of that right now. When I first started practicing in employment law, uh, we saw a lot of that back back during the uh, Great Recession, if you will. Um, and then it calmed down. Hopefully, it won't be too long that we're seeing a lot of layoffs. But right now, we do see a fair amount of those. And those are some pretty serious claims when they're valid for numerous reasons, not the least of which is an employee who has not been paid appropriately many times under the applicable laws can recover um, some kind of enhanced damages and attorney's fees. Is that right? That's correct. So the laws are all uh, built in a way that incentivizes plaintiff's counsel to take those cases because they want to make sure folks get paid their wages, even if it's just a small amount due. So most uh, wage and hour laws throughout the country, including the the federal law, the Fair Labor Standards Act, have attorney's fees provisions. And then many laws will have varying levels of of kind of uh, a punishment tacked on. So the FLSA has liquidated damages, which is times two. And then state laws can have treble damages, and there may be more that have, have even more. And when there is a reduction in force at a facility, what kind of things does a plaintiff's attorney anticipate coming out of that? What are you keeping your eyes open for? So the rare, you know, question if it's a mass layoff or a large riff is you're going to go through Warren Act issues and see if, if the employer followed the Warren Act, assuming the Warren Act covered the riff. Most employers that have good labor and employment counsel on the employer side are, are going to follow the rules there. So what we end up looking at, let's say it's a layoff with a severance, is we're going to go through that severance agreement and give the prospective client insight on A, the, the terms that are in the agreement, and B, whether or not they should sign it. So the ADA in compliance with the ADA is something that on the management side, we frequently see our clients struggling with. And I'm interested in, from where you sit, if you're also seeing um, those types of issues, whether they're uh, disability-based discrimination claims or failure to accommodate claims, and what you're seeing employers get tripped up on in particular with respect to the ADA. Yeah, and I think we've all seen an uptick on both sides of the, the V on 
ADA issues, a lot of them have to do with the request that employees return to work. And where I'm seeing the most problems is just a failure to engage in the interactive process. Um, I think there's this idea that, yeah, you got to return to work. This is where your job is. But if somebody asks for an accommodation, the law expects an employer to, to engage in an interactive process to say, well, hey, you know, working from home is not going to work from us, but we could do this, this, and this. And if an employer does not approach that reasonably, they can get into big trouble. The ADA, like those wage and hour laws, is also going to have um, fee shifting provision to the employee um, and uh, other punitive type damages on top. With respect to the ADA, something that you know I frequently see our clients struggle with is there's not necessarily a direct request by the employee, I need fill in the blank due to my uh, condition, my health condition. Oftentimes, the request for an accommodation can be more nuanced than that. Are you seeing situations where due to a lack of training or just not understanding the law, supervisors or others in charge of engaging in that interactive process maybe are just failing to recognize the request for an accommodation altogether? Yeah, and on both sides. So I'll, I'll see employees from where I sit come in and say they're asking me for, for my medical records and, and they're asking me about my health condition. Um, and my response is, yeah, and give it to them. Give it all to them in writing, uh, shout it from the rooftops what you need and, and when you need it. I think people, it, it starts with an employee who's shy to talk about some medical condition and some need for uh, an accommodation, and then an employer who reasonably so does not want to pry. But we're, we're both working towards the same end, which is we want the employee in this scenario, if they can be reasonably accommodated, to be reasonably accommodated in a way that allows them to earn a paycheck, but also be a profitable employee for the company. And one other follow-up question related to the ADA. Do you still see employers getting tripped up on FMLA leave has expired? You've taken all of the FMLA leave you're entitled to you don't get any more leave after that, we're gonna go ahead and terminate your employment and then missing that additional leave time beyond the 12 weeks the employee may have available for FMLA. Yeah. Or with some employees, they're not even eligible for FMLA to begin with and they make a leave request related to a medical condition. Do you see employers missing that the ADA can potentially protect that type of leave um, for for your clients? Yeah, yeah, and I think you're, you're, you're uh focusing in on the intersection between the ADA and the FMLA. So, I mean, you know, at the very basic level, does the employer's handbook say that any PTO or sick leave is going to run concurrent with the FMLA leave? If it doesn't, well, they've got that leave stored up. Or does it have to burn first before they go on FMLA leave? And then even if they burn through their 60 working days of FMLA leave, giving unpaid time off or an extended leave may be a reasonable accommodation. So assuming they ask for it in a, in a way that's going to be close enough for the court to consider, the employer needs to then say, well, can we accommodate their request for um, unpaid time off or, or some other accommodation? And, you know, unpaid time off looks like a pretty easy thing to, to do. I mean, from, from an employee's perspective, um, employers obviously, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis have to see whether or not that would work. But failure to engage in that interactive process outright can lead to big problems. There, there was a recent verdict in the uh, uh, district court in North Carolina, a $22 million verdict, uh, where an employer uh, and an employee, an employee was called back to work. And the employee said, you know, I, I want to keep working from home. The employer said, you can't do that. The employee said, okay, well, I, I can come back, but because of my condition, I need to be placed uh, next to a bathroom. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of facts in that case uh, that, that cause, you know, defenses to be made and, and arguments to be made on both sides. But at the surface level, that seems like a very reasonable request and, 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 that resulted in a very large verdict. The employee was very highly compensated. And so under our ADA, even though you have certain limitations to damages, that will be a large, uh, large economic victory for that employee and that uh, employee's lawyer who, who I, I wish was me. 
Well, speaking of those large verdicts, what trends are you seeing when employees prevail in those employ employment claims? That you, what trends are you seeing that the juries are particularly sympathetic to? Yeah, so I think like, and a lot of this may be wishful thinking, but I think post-COVID juries are a little pissed off. Um, and, and if we need to add a, a, a little angry, um, if you put the right case in front of a jury, the right employment case, you're going to get a large response. And in, in uh, the, the North Carolina area, there's been two recent verdicts, a $22 million verdict that, that we just talked about, um, and then a, a $10 million verdict in a, in a race case. Uh, in South Carolina, we, we've got a history of, of strong verdicts in employment law, and, and regionally, I think verdicts are on the up. I think your firm, um, though it's not an individual employment case, just secured a $96 million verdict um, in a trade secret theft case. So juries want to make a statement in the post-COVID world, and with the right facts and presenting your case in the right way, you can get a jury fired up. And employment law is emotional. It's emotionally charged. I, I remember my very first trial um, was in state court in Florence County, and neither me nor my co-counsel had ever tried a case before. We bought, there's this book in, in our jurisdiction called How to Try Your First Case. We brought that to trial, but had a blank piece of copy paper taped, to, taped over the cover. So our opposition counsel who had tried, according to his website, you know, hundreds of cases, couldn't see it. Um, but we got the jury fired up. And they, they awarded a multi-million dollar verdict in that case. It's been all downhill ever since, but I, <laughs> I have seen the top of the mountain. Um, and so if you get the right jury on the right case, it can be very risky for an employer and very fruitful for an employee. And the lesson there, never stop learning and reading about what you should be doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and listen to your good counsel on the mm -hmm. employer side. So you, you hired good counsel, trust your good counsel when they say, you know, we need to, to file this motion. We need to address this legally. And if that doesn't work out, we, there, there's a time for war and there's also a time for peace. So, Paul, do you have any suggestions for our listeners on how they might be able to go about resolving employment-related claims early, things that your clients would be particularly receptive to on the settlement negotiation discussion front? You're, you've talked about how emotional employment cases are. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear kind of teeing off of that, um, but also just in general, how you think employers might go about resolving these matters early as opposed to facing one of these juries potentially. Money. Um, no, that, that's a bit of a joke. Um, so we, we started this discussion talking about layoffs. And w when I've got a severance agreement, we're going to look at what the consideration is, what the monetary consideration is. And we're also going to look at what they're giving up. You know, they're releasing all claims. And we're going to see, are the claims worth more or less than the agreement? And there's a certain price tag that an employee who's just lost their job is going to take irrespective of the strength or weakness of their claims because they need that bridge to their 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 next um employer. And so if an employer with good counsel can find that sweet spot, they're going to get a deal um, at, at the outset. And, you know, some employers have ERISA plans on severance and settlement. Usually those employers' plans are pretty lucrative. Like if I've got a, a, a high-level exec who's got a six-figure severance, it's hard to walk away from that. If you've got a uh, working class person who's got, you know, three months plus of pay. It's hard to walk away from that. The, the typical working person in this country, according to some studies, couldn't cover a $400 emergency. So people in this condition need to be paid appropriately. It's when the severance amount is really small that they're, they're probably not going to take it. That's the the dollars and cents way to stop it. Um, the, the other way, you know, if you can't do it financially is to do it with a lot of dignity, a lot of care, do it in the most professional way possible and, and most polite and courteous way, thanking your, you know, acknowledging your employees' years of service. And um, 
some of my uh, best settlements have been where an employer apologizes to an employee because that makes it so much easier for everybody to uh, work things out. If the employer can handle the layoff in a dignified and respectful fashion um, or a separation, an individual separation, I think the likelihood of litigation plummets. And just to switch gears here, we've been talking a lot on our podcast about AI and how it's being used with employers, with employees, and even the the pitfalls of using AI in recruitment. I was curious, have you used in your practice AI and how have you implemented that? Yeah, so I, I, I've started using um, mostly ChatGPT's product, uh, the, the, and I use it for administrative type functions, you know, proofreading. Um, I used to, we have a 300 day deadline in employment law to file charges of discrimination. I used to go to timeanddate.com, put in, plug in the date, say add 300 days. Now I just say to, to, to the AI, tell me what 300 days from this date is. And it cranks it out. Um, for proofreading, you, you tell it what you want to proofread. You tell it how you want it to proofread. You tell it, spit it out in hard brackets so I can see your change. So I'm still using my thinking lawyer's brain. And, and not taking it, you know, as perfect. Um, and I think within reason and within our ethics, lawyers have to start adopting that because it is, and, and employers too, because it is enabling certain uh, functions of a, a creative professional's job to be done so much simpler and, and with way fewer errors. Um, so I use it for proofreading. I'll use it to summarize, you know, a text wall email. If somebody's going to send me a 10 page deficiency letter, an employer's counsel, I'm going to have it summarize that, um, you know, we use it for the things that aren't creative, that are uh, more functional in nature. And if you learn how to use it well, you can do your clients a great service. So I do have one final question for you, and I'm very interested in your answer to this one. Oftentimes on the management side, I have conversations with our clients about whether or not to give a reason for why you are separating an employee from the employment relationship. Say it's not a reduction in force, it's an, an individual employment termination. And many times our clients will say, well, it's an at-will state, I don't have to give a reason. and. I'm interested to know in particular whether you think that giving a reason for the termination and having the discussion with the individual is less likely to lead to uh, a charge or litigation or whether you think it's maybe less likely to lead to a charge or litigation if they don't give a reason at all. I think in a perfect world, both from an employer standpoint and an employee standpoint, you would give a reason. Um, if someone treat others how you'd want to be treated, give them a reason if you can. And if you're terminating an employee, I'm sure you got a reason. Now the question is, that is it a reason you're comfortable sharing? If the reason's performance, if the reason is, um, you know, the economics of the company, if the reason is profitability, just say that. And if you've got the um, info to back it up then what's the problem? Where the problem lies and, and where I think there's caution is, okay, well, there's gonna be a plaintiff's employee who's gonna compare this situation to the situation of their peers and did we do the same thing? And on an enterprise scale, that can be very difficult. So I understand at times there, there's not an easy path, but there's a reason a larger employer is gonna have a progressive disciplinary policy. There's a reason they're gonna have ways to give substandard notices of, or notices of substandard performance put somebody on a PIP. You you want a terminated employee to not be surprised when they walk in to be terminated if it's for their own doing. They should see it coming a mile away. Um, and in those cases, I don't know that it really curbs litigation because, you know, nobody thinks they should be terminated or very few do. Um, but if the employer gives a reason and it's the truth and they've got the receipts to back it up, you know, they're going to they're gonna fare well no matter what happens. That's good advice. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. It's always great to have these conversations with uh, somebody who represents the plaintiff's bar so well. So thank you very much uh, for being here and spending some time with us. Jenny, thanks for being here with me. And we will see you next time on Work This Way. Mm -hmm.